Thank you, Christopher, for the kind words. Thanks to the organizers, when I got the message, Malmö calling, I didn't expect this here. It's such a fantastic uh, event, and thanks to all of you in the audience, of course, uh, I guess for uh, being willing to listen to talk about slime, which obviously isn't everyone's um, favorite topic. Uh, at times I thought I was the only one who was interested in this stuff. Um, in the last few years, till uh, I started working on the book, I've talked much more about slime than I ever thought uh, was possible. And I thought I'd begin the talk um, with uh, a question that basically every single time comes up in every conversation and in every interview. How on earth did I end up writing about slime? Why not butterflies or flowers? So many lovely um, subjects around. And as Christopher said already, um, I, I got the idea almost 20 years ago um, through an article in the magazine on uh, the slime trails that snails leave behind and uh, messages that are hidden in there. I had no idea that there's anything to read in slime, but apparently, for example, male snails, at least in some species, find their mating partners through the slime trails because the slime will tell them uh, the species, if she's female, um, the direction she went, important, of course, um, if she's uh, healthy, no parasites, and if she's pretty, which in snail terms means not so skinny, by the way. Um, so, there's so much interesting stuff to slime that I can't even begin to tell you, but I'll try to give you at least an idea and, and show you some examples. Just a, sh a quick note um, before, I'm a writer, so I don't have any artwork or any scientific visuals that I can show you, so I had to just take pictures from different sources. There are some that don't have any copyright. Um, they were taken by my son Noah, who is a very gifted photographer, and thanks to me, probably uh, now the, the only person who really knows how to uh, take pictures of slimy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the, what's the take-home message about slime? It's probably that all life is slimy. Very, very, very slimy. Microbes, plants, animals, and of course, as humans as well, even if we don't see it. Um, slime is so flexible uh, that it can be used basically for all, for all jobs that there are for any life form. So for example, that's, that the plant is a carnivore, so it will feed on the insects that uh, that get caught in the slimy droplets. That's a glue, that particular slime. Um, others build structures, like that, that's the biofilm. Biofilms are slimes made by microbes, and that's probably the peak slime performance we have on Earth, because, of course, life was, uh, for billions of years, only microbial, and they had time to just perfect that skill. So this is, a, is one that has been grown in the lab, so it's rather pretty. They don't have to look like that. They can be formless uh, goo, um, but the structure is rather complex on the inside. Uh, sometimes they're even called these biofilm cities of microbes because there are different neighborhoods inside, so the different species of microbes can live according to their own needs and likes and dislikes. They have channels for communication, for, uh, to transport liquids, and nutrients will be shared, um, and the garbage will be collected and disposed. Um, that's the fascinating thing about um, these biofilms. Uh, the problem is, of course, that they're rather hard to defeat when we come in conflict with them. One of them, for example, is the slimy buildup we have on our teeth. And so far, the most powerful weapons we have against them is a toothbrush and, and dental floss. Nothing else, because they stick so well, we can't really get rid of them any other way. It's even more problematic if they develop in the body, let's say on a medical implant, or if there's a wound, bacteria get inside, uh, because this is not only a city, it's like a slimy bunker, and they can even keep antibiotics and other drugs away. So these biofilms are really, really hard to defeat. Um, there are, of course, other uses uh, for, for slimes, like we've heard with the snails uh, finding a mating partner, but reproduction in general is very slimy from beginning to end. Um, locomotion, like the snails, of course, um, defense uh, is a big theme against predators, but also against pathogens and parasites. Um, and there's actually so much slime going around, mainly uh, due to microbes that sec secrete the stuff like everywhere. There's uh, even the moist environment, or there's water and a solid surface, that slime is even a factor, or biological slime, I should say, in the environment. 
there are some ecosystems um, that look the way they look and they function uh, the way they function in part because of slime, like deserts, for example. Um, deserts need biological slime to counteract erosion or wetlands. They're also squishy in part because they're very slimy. There's biological slime in there. And the oceans, I'm sorry to say, if you like to swim there, are slimy from top to bottom. Um, to give you just one example, um, the whole surface of the ocean is covered in a, like a skin of slime. It's too thin to see with the naked eye, but it's there. And it's really important because every single exchange between the atmosphere and the oceans has to pass through there. Right? The oceans produce a lot of oxygen. Every single molecule has to go through that slime barrier. Equally, the oceans take up a lot of CO2, thankfully, from the atmosphere that has to go through there as well. So obviously, slime is... Uh, is really important. It's important, it's everywhere, we couldn't do without it. We, we personally wouldn't survive without it. Uh, and we all know what it is, we recognize the slime, right? If you see it, if you touch it, no doubt about it, this is slime. So it should be easy to explain what it is, but there isn't a definition for slime. And that has probably to do with the fact that slime isn't a specific substance, it's more like sliminess is a quality that materials can have. And I interviewed one um, researcher who works on microbes, uh, how he would define slime, and he said, it's stiff water, it's just stiff water. And that's, that's not a bad description, actually, because um, what all biological slimes have in common is a lot of water is bound in there. At least 90%, often 96 or 97% of a slime is water, and that water is bound in a way, in a three-dimensional molecular network, that it can't flow the way it wants to flow. So it's a bit of a tug and pull between the water that wants to flow, that gives the liquid part, the liquid characteristics, versus the network that keeps it back. And that's what really slime is about. And that inner structure, and the fact that there's so much water in it makes biological slimes hydrogels. But that's a huge group of materials. Not all hydrogels are biological slimes, but definitely real biological slimes belong in there. And with that structure come certain characteristics um, that we can use, that all life can use um, for their own needs. Um, for example, um, in our very own body. So if we think about barriers, our, our first barrier, uh, the barrier between us and the environment, of course, is the skin. That's what we think of. But skin, from my perspective, is a bit boring um, because it's, it's rather, it's dense. Um, it's supposed to keep pathogens out and water in. Now our slimy barriers, and there are four systems, like a medieval fortress that has one barrier after the other to keep intruders out, um, have to keep pathogens away, but also to remain open. If you uh, think about the, the mucus layer, the mucus layer that, we, uh, layer that we have in the gut, billions of microbes pass through there that are supposed just to be removed, but at the same time, nutrients, of course, have to enter the body. And another job, and that's quite a bit of uh, multitasking for stiff water, um, billions of microbes that we actually want to live in our body, the microbiome, live in that very same mucus. So all our mucus barriers, all our slime barriers, have to find the right balance between repelling what is dangerous and letting in and allowing the exchange that's necessary. And that means for pathogens, of course, even if they navigate one of our mucus barriers in the airways, uh, in the gut, in the genital tract, um, they will soon find another slime barrier. There's one that fortifies our tissue and organs. Our cells all carry slimy coats for protection, and even the cell nuclei are protected by tiny hydrogels. So it's not easy, actually, to, to infect us. Um, I chose that illustration um, by David Goodsell uh, because this is a mucus that has kept us busy for more than two years, usually without even naming it the mucus. That's a respiratory droplet with a coronavirus in pink trapped inside. And of course, there were many discussions uh, among scientists and doctors. Um, how infectious is that thing if it gets spread via these droplets and aerosols? How far can it travel? Will it survive? And can you be infected if you, if you catch one of those droplets? Um, and the surprising thing was that if these droplets land on, let's say, a surface, someone sneezes there who's infected, you can touch it, you can touch your nose, and it's very unlikely that you get the disease because those squiggly things in green, 
These are the slime building molecules that build the network mucins, trap the virus even though it's, it's still viable in a way that it can't uh, infect anyone anymore. So our mucuses, our slimes are just great um, traps for pathogens actually, but there's more. Um, as hydrogels that somehow oscillate between being liquid or a bit more solid, um, slimes, biological slimes can change their behavior. So if you look at a snail that crawls, crawls on, on slime, you will hopefully see those dark bands traveling along the length. And these are contractions of the muscles. They bulge out like a wave and push on the slime underneath. And if the pressure is strong enough, the inner structure, the inner network of the slime at that particular spot will break down. That means the slime becomes more liquid. The snail can glide over that particular spot. Once the contraction has passed, that's a cool thing to do. The network will just repair itself. The slime hardens again, and the snail can push off. That's how a snail crawls, or one scientist called it. This is how an animal with only one foot walks on chewing gum, because slime, of course, is always um, a bit sticky as well. So, but there's more. It's not only a mechanical stress that will change the behavior um, of slime, pH or the acidity in the environment is important as well. One great example here is the, genial, uh, the, the female genital tract with the egg cell waiting uh, for sperm, here represented by Sleeping Beauty. If you remember the fairy tale, um, she's, uh, the princess is asleep in the castle, a hedge grows up, a thorny hedge, the thorns kill a bunch of princes. Um, one day, the prince, the prince shows up, and the hedge opens up. Thorns turn into flowers, and even guiding hands, etc. He wins the prize. And since they live happily, happily after, after, ever after, uh, it's easy to forget that he didn't really do anything. Um, no dragons to face down. I mean, he he might be especially bright or charming, uh, intelligent, but we never know. The only thing that's it's in his favor is that he shows up on that particular day because it's exactly a hundred day, a hundred years after the curse was put on her, so she was bound to wake up anyway. Uh, that guy has perfect timing, um, and it's exactly the same for sperm, because the uterus could be like a major gateway for pathogens to enter the body. Uh, so it has to be closed off. That means at the cervix, there's a major mucus barrier that's very dense, usually uh, almost impenetrable. But of course, the sperm prince somehow has to find the princess. That means that during the fertile days in each menstrual cycle, that barrier will change. It will become thinner, more liquid. Uh, sperm can get through, but only the good ones. Um, uh, weak swimmers will still be filtered out, so the barrier function is still there, and then the barrier will close up again. And the body controls this behavior by changing the pH, the acidity in the environment. So I hope you will all agree that slimes are great, really important, can do lots of stuff. So why are we so disgusted by it? That's actually the slime that hagfish produce. Um, uh, I mean, I love slime, really. I do, I appreciate it. And I still have to admit that it makes sense because disgust is one of our fundamental emotions and it's supposed from a biological um, perspective to keep us away from pathogens and, and from parasites. Um, the thing is, or the big problem, or the rather small problem is that we can't see uh, microbes, right? That's in the name, they're microscopically small. So how is that disgust early warning system supposed to warn us if the danger is invisible? And I think that it, it's, that's why it's triggered by phenomena that are often associated with microbes or microbial contamination, like bad smells and slime, obviously. So that makes sense. But the whole system is a bit imprecise. It's, it's like a blunt tool. Um, what's also important is that disgust has to work really, really fast. There shouldn't be any time for you to think, oh, there's a slime. Is it really dangerous? Can I smell it? Because then you could uh, be infected. So you have to be repulsed like this. So the tool becomes even blunter, um, which means that 
discussed reactions can be very powerful. Now, I think that for most people, most of the time in the history of humanity, that wasn't a problem because daily life would still force you to, to deal with whatever slimy or suspicious stuff was around. That means even now, of course, if you live where dirty water from the river is the only water that we had, you will drink that. You will not die from thirst. If, mold, if moldy bread is the only food you have, you will not starve uh, and just say, it's so disgusting, I won't eat it, right? Um, so usually disgust is very powerful, but reality reigns it in, or not anymore. That's what I think, um, that at least in industrialized societies, in a sense, we've, we have outsourced slime and other offensive substances, thanks to sanitation, hospitals take care of the sick, garbage disposal, apart from sex, slime isn't really uh, a part of our uh, daily life anymore. And I think that this is why our disgust often is, is like completely freewheeling. Nothing is, is, is reining it in or keeping a check on it. And I speak from experience. I mean, I, I know now, thanks to the book, uh, that I have friends who even find the word slime disgusting. Uh, I have relatives who haven't read the book yet because they can't force themselves to crack it even open, let alone read it. And the best part, yay, there are booksellers who refuse to stock it because they find the subject too disgusting, not even the book. Um, so that's maybe a bit over the top. Uh, and according to my publisher, this was a first as well. So uh, yay me. Uh, uh, I, th I think or I hope that that excessive disgust reaction when it comes to slime will change because that's what we're here to talk about, um, uses of that amazing stuff. And very often, of course, if you engage with, with something that maybe you didn't like before, it becomes more interesting. It was the same for me. I didn't start out as a slime fan. It just happened uh, in the course of the research. And where does slime even come up? Um, for example, when we talk about intelligence, of course, uh, intelligence, that's a very slippery concept. Uh, we started out as intelligence is what, surprise, human-like brains produce. Then there were um, animals like the octopus, that's not even a vertebrate, doesn't obviously have a human-like brain, but it's still very, very smart. So, okay, maybe intelligence, we, we can't be that narrow. And now we have creases like this. This is a slime mold that I found in the forest where it was busy munching around a mushroom in slow motion. Um, that, can, that doesn't even fit in any category. It's not an animal, it's not, uh, a, it doesn't belong to the fungi, um, and it's not even sure if you could call it, uh, it an individual, because even though they start out, out as uh, single cell um, organisms, they can come together. This is one, one giant cell with thousands of nuclei, cell nuclei inside. So it's not really a group, it can be an individual as well. It's somewhere that the boundary is blurred. And, but still, it's just, in a sense, slime on the move. Slime that's alive and on the move. Um, but it's uh, surprisingly smart for that. Uh, there's, of course, one um, famous experiment where they put a slime mold on a map of Tokyo and put incentives, oatmeal, on the cities around it. And it took the slime mold just a really short time to find, like, the, the perfect connections to, to make the most effective and, and best network between those dots. And that network very closely resembled the actual train network of Tokyo and the surrounding cities. Um, the big surprise here was that the slime mold, that liquid brain, without a single nerve cell, let alone a brain or any solid structures, found uh, that solution rather quickly the same solution that took engineers and I was working on it a really long time to figure out. So I can't really say what computers can do, what AI can do, but uh, it's been said um, that this liquid brain, as some call it, is superior when it comes to that kind uh, of, of complex problem. Another thing that slime can do, I mean, here we're not talking about the alive slime mold and more just the slime itself, which is not alive, of course, but we've seen it can do great things like adapt to the environment. And that's another thing. Um, like, we, like we talk about uh, the snails and the trails, they can find their mating partners, so there's, there are messages encoded in the slime. Um, sometimes these messages are like a note to self, 
there are limpets, these are snails uh, that live on the coastline with a pointy shell. They need to get back to the home place before ebb time to bunker down and, and hunker down uh, so that they're not uh, dry out. And they find a way along their own slime trail. They just follow it back. One bonus is that at least uh, one species uh, deposits so much slime in the process and that slime is rather nutritious that they grow a garden of algae there that they can graze on. So, um, yeah, multitasking slime. What you see here is my pet slime mold. That's already dead, unfortunately. That's just a, a spoonful of the, of the slime mold that was munching on the, on the mushroom. And, but here it's still alive, eating the oatmeal, of course. And the whitish network that you see here, um, that's what the slime mold leaves behind. At first, it starts out to find food. If nothing's to be found, it will pull back, but leave those slime trails behind. And if it ever happens uh, to come to the same place again, it will recognize its own slime trails, these ghost trails, and know that it's, it's useless to look for food here. I've been here. Um, but there are also some slimy creatures that are predatory, but special snails that have even a lip that looks like this, like a moustache, it's like a slime scanner. So they find either mating partners or prey. That's all encoded in the slime. It's like a communication tool of animals in one species, between species, like the prey, unfortunate prey and the predator. Um, or like this here is like um, an external memory, external spatial memory. I was here, don't try to find food again. So there's absolutely a lot we can learn from, from slime, from biological slime, I should say. Um, and, but to do that, we have to understand first how it works, right? What, what are the building blocks? Um, one very attractive trait that slime has and that many material scientists would like to replicate is that it's self-healing, like the mucus in our gut that has to be replenished all the time but we don't end up with layer on layer on layer, but the new mucus will just integrate into the existing network. And that's, that's uh, something that, of course, many materials uh, could, could make use of. Uh, when it comes uh, to the building blocks, we all know it, of course, um, certain um, toy building blocks, they're so attractive because you can do many, many different thing things with them. That's not only single use. Um, and slime does the same. There are at least some glues um, that are very effective and that use the same building blocks. That was the big surprise when these slimes got, uh, got analyzed. Uh, some animals in the sea produce weak glues, others very strong ones, but the, but the building blocks are rather similar. But not only in the sea, on land as well. Um, this is a velvet worm, an evolutionary very old um, animal uh, with a unique hunting um, strategy you might see on the side of the head, there's like this bulging gland, there's another one on the other side, and that's a cannon that shoots slime. So the velvet worm will shoot the slime, the slime hits the prey animal, the slime hardens, the prey can't move, velvet worm with its stubby legs takes its time to get there and feed. Um, a group in Singapore has recently analyzed that slime because it's, there's another thing that's very attractive that this one can do. Um, even though it hardens so fast, it can be reactivated if you add water. It works again and again, just like the first time. So maybe we get some glues um, from here, and we desperately need new glues. I mean, we live in a world full of glues. Everything's glued, the furniture, shoes, books, everything. But the conventional ones that we have are often toxic, so you can't use them on living tissue, for example, which would be cool. Uh, you can't recycle them, which means very often you can't recycle the whole product that they used in. Um, and they don't stick very well underwater, which, of course, every single marine snail manages like that, <laughs> even in a strong current. Um, speaking of the, of the medical applications, this is a glue that's actually much further developed already. It was based on the mucus that ordinary garden slugs produce. Um, so this is based more, it's not like a perfect imitation, it's more like the principle that the slugs use. And they tested this in, in animals and it sticks very well even on, on bloody tissue. They put it on, I think, a, a, a bloody beating heart and none of our glues would, would stick there, right, with the contractions. And, this one did. So they even used it to, for surgery on animals that were still in the womb, which is, which is like a cool thing if you think about that you can repair some damage 
before the animal is even born, um, and then close up the uterus and develop, uh, the development will be normal. Um, they even branched out with this. Now they have a new one um, that works and sticks on tendons that so far can't, uh, can't be repaired very well. <laughs> There's so much to tell. Um, that's just one other thing. Um, from last week, uh, vaccines have a problem that you have to, to cool them uh, in, in order to keep them stable. And they destabilize very, um, very quickly, especially if you're maybe in a warm country where you, where you don't have a fridge or anything, and then they have to be thrown out. This is a hydrogel, a rather new one, that, where they can be stored in the scaffold, and they will keep, and this could be like a real breakthrough. Um, last one. Um, so, obviously, there are endless possibilities to use slimes, especially biological slimes, um, but there are risks as well. Uh, and I thought the, the jellyfish could be like the poster animal for that. Uh, a jellyfish, like many other animals, produce a mucus that's a great filter. That's another function. Um, and there's a big EU project uh, that tries to use that mucus to filter out microplastics from the sea, which, of course, is, is a big problem. But um, jellyfish could be among the few survivors of a very dire future in the warming oceans, more acidic oceans, um, with the destruction of, of the habitats, the overfishing. Um, like some scientists call it an age of slime, where only jellyfish bloom, there are microbial mats, algal mats, everything is suffocating in, in slime because no one else can survive there. And the interesting thing is that there was actually an old age of, uh, of slime in, in evolution before. Speaking of prejudices against slime, it's called the boring billion years. Um, the difference then, of course, uh, of course, was that animals hadn't been invented that yet, but this age of slime would be uh, the consequence of a catastrophic loss of biodiversity. So, to get to a close, when it comes to slime in our own body, in the environment, everywhere, too much and too little is equally bad. So the balance that we have right now works perfectly. So let's try to keep it. <laughs> Thank you.